It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Speaker, uh, Speaker, good morning. Yesterday, we kicked off National Nursing Week. Doesn't it say so much that just yesterday, this Conservative government passed a law that's going to sell off our health care system to corporations who can make money off the backs of sick people? And I want to remind everyone here, this is something that the nurses of this province deeply oppose. The Conservatives are going down a path that both Quebec and British Columbia already found was a dead end. It cost everyone more. The government, individual patients, it worsened health outcomes, and in the end, it made it harder as well on health care workers. Speaker, to the Premier, will you stop the hemorrhaging of nurses out of our public health care system when there was nothing in the legislation to prevent it? To reply, the Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. You know, Speaker, with the greatest of respect, the NDP could not be more wrong yeah. about Bill 60. I will highlight what the Auditor-General's report on outpatient surgeries in Ontario emphasized, that the experience in other Canadian jurisdictions that community surgical centres can treat 20 to 30 percent more patients within the same amount of time. Why are other Canadian jurisdictions doing it, and why is Ontario doing it more? Because we want people to get access to surgery and not sit in wait lines. Thank you. The supplementary question. You know, this is how out of touch this government is. If they actually got out of the back rooms and talked to the people on the front line, the nurses, the health care workers, they'd know the mess that they have created already in health care staffing. Ontario's nurses have been chronically overworked, underpaid, and undermined by this Conservative government. And now, Speaker, nurses are currently without a contract. This week, we're going to be tabling petitions with thousands of signatures calling on this government to present a fair and meaningful offer to their negotiations. Speaker, to the Premier, will his government give Ontario's nurses a contract that shows how much we value them? Thank you, Speaker. There is no doubt that we, in this side of the House, understand the very valuable, um, important role that nurses play in our health care system, which is, frankly, exactly why, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, we initiated a Learn and Stay program under the leadership of the College of Nurses Ministry. It allows nurses who want to practice in the province of Ontario and train in the province of Ontario to have the tuition and their books covered if they are willing to practice in an underserved area for two years after graduation. What did that one program do? It ensured that we had the highest number of students applying for those programs. There are many, many people who want to practice in their communities, in health care, and we're going to enable that through our legislation. Thank you, Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, they are leaving Ontario. You cannot recruit into a broken program. With all of their efforts, we're going to be 33,000 nurses and PSWs short in this province, and that's a fact. Speaker, that response does not give me a lot of hope, because while this government says one thing in this House, they say quite another thing to Ontario's nurses, and their actions speak louder than their words. This government continues to take our nurses to court. It's a fact. They're fighting with them and with other public sector workers over their unconstitutional wage restraint law. Speaker, to the Premier, will he celebrate National Nursing Week by ending his campaign to take Ontario's nurses to court? Yes. Minister of Health. Another thing that we did when uh, we came back after a larger majority victory in June was, in fact, talk to and work with our partners at the College of Nurses of Ontario. And we said, we have far too many internationally educated and trained nurses waiting in the queue to come and practice in our communities. Would you work with us to ensure that those individuals who are waiting at the College's Nurses for Assessment get Order. that assessment, review, and ultimately approved license faster? What did that do, Speaker? It meant that we had the historic high of new internationally educated nurses practicing in game in our communities, in our hospitals, in our ability to 
to ensure that whether it is new nurses being trained, Response. internationally educated nurses who want to come to Ontario, we are doing the work here. Thank yeah. you, Speaker. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, Ontarians are waking up today to news that expanded for-profit private health care is now the law of the land. And in rural and northern communities, they are rightly worried about the impact that two-tier health care is going to have on already strained hospitals and community health centres. I was in Thunder Bay last week, and like many communities across the north, they're worried that the local hospitals that they proudly support and rely on are going to be closing their doors as staff are forced out by low wages and private sector competition in the south. Speaker, to the Premier, Order. why is this government putting private profits ahead of the needs of patients in the north? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I want to rem remind members opposite that, in fact, we have over 900 community diagnostic operating rooms in 900 Order. operating in the province of Ontario right now. What are we doing through Bill 60? We are ensuring that your constituents who are waiting in line, who are waiting for scheduled surgeries, have the opportunity to get that faster. We did it at the beginning of the year by announcing three expanded cataract surgeries in Windsor, in Kitchener, Waterloo, and in Ottawa. That means Order. that people are back with their families, back on the job, back in community where they want to be. They don't want to be on a wait list. And we're expanding because we want to make sure that your constituents have the ability to get access to the health care they deserve in community faster. Great. Thank you, we're Speaker. And a supplementary question. Speaker, I want to remind the Minister and the Premier that 2.2 million Ontarians don't have access to a family doctor right now. And in Northern Ontario, we know the shortage is chronic, and it's going to get worse now. As these for-profit corporate clinics set up shop in more lucrative urban locations, it's going to be even harder or even impossible for smaller rural hospitals to recruit and retain the staff they need. That is what we are hearing from the front lines. You should listen to them. Northern and First Nations communities know that this government's plan to, re to replace community-based care with private for-profit clinics is going to make their access to health care even worse. Speaker, to the Premier, why are you making it even harder for people in the North to get the care they need? Mr. Health. Now, Speaker, the NDP will continue to say the status quo is good enough. It's not good enough. We need to have people accessing care faster. And one of the ways that we are doing this Order. is absolutely expanding the clinical and diagnostic piece. Here, here. The other part is actually building out the health human resources so that, as an example, because of the passage of Bill 60, we have, as of right, in the province of Ontario, first Canadian jurisdiction to do so, which means that a physician practicing in British Columbia today can tomorrow start working in Ontario. Because we know that we want to eliminate the barriers, eliminate the red tape to make sure that individuals who want to come here, who want to practice, who want to, to be in our world-class medical Response. facilities have that ability without um, the many, many red tape uh, barriers that we've seen in the past. The final supplementary. Speaker, the minister doesn't want to talk about the North, I guess. Let me introduce a concept to you. Highway health care. Highway health care is what happens when this government forces Northerners to travel long distances, sometimes thousands of kilometres away from their families to receive the health care that they Order. need. The Northern Health Travel Grant gives them $100 for a hotel. Well, good luck finding anything for that price anywhere. And worrying about that when you're sick, just great. Speaker, to the Premier, if he's focused on destroying our health care system and more Northerners are going to have to travel even farther Order. to get the care they need, will he at least enhance these supports? Members, will please take their seats. Minister of Health. 
Is the leader of the NDP suggesting that when we expand MRIs into new facilities, new communities in the north, in the south, in rural communities that have never had an MRI in their hospital before, that that is status quo that you're happy with? It is not. Our government is making the changes that will ensure that people will get access in their communities. And one of the ways that we're doing that is actually integrating the health care system. Instead of having individual hospitals, individual organizations, we're making sure that those partnerships ensure that individuals who are on wait lists, whether it's for cataracts, hips or knee replacement surgeries, can get it in their community. That is what Bill 60 is about. It is about challenging the status quo, ensuring and engaging in innovation that is frankly happening across Ontario. We're empowering hospitals to do that. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. The Ombudsman's damning report called out the Ontario's Landlord and Tenant Board's failure to provide justice to thousands of Ontarians. And the Advocacy Centre for Tenants Ontario has been sounding the alarm for years that tenants have been struggling to participate in the LTB's online hearing process. We read in the Ombudsman report about a woman who waited 10 months for a hearing only to have trouble logging on on the day, and as a result, her case was dismissed and her access to justice was denied. Shame. To ensure everyone gets a fair hearing, experts are calling for in-person hearings to be easily available to people who request them. Can this government implement that recommendation? To respond to the government, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the report from the Ombudsman. And one of the things that he did say was that when we took government in 2018, the previous government supported by the NDP, and I'm paraphrasing what the Ombudsman said, of course, but he said that the technology was, was redundant, that it was broken, and we have invested $28.5 million in cutting-edge systems so that people can access justice, Mr. Speaker. In terms of in-person hearings, people can request uh, in-person help. They can uh, go to locations in London and Ottawa, Toronto, and, and other spaces. Uh, we also have a mobile service to help people that don't have the technology. So we are doing things to make sure that we're doing digital first, but not digital only. And I look forward to the supplementary supplementary question where I'll talk about some of the other investments that we've made, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question, the member for Toronto Centre. Yes, thank you very much. There's only been less than 1% of actual hearings that were actually in person. My question to the Premier on the same specific issue is the Ombudsman's scathing report included many heartbreaking stories. A tenant's home was so unsafe that it made her ill. So in December 2020, she then applied to the LTB. Her case was then heard only 16 months later after she already made the difficult decision to leave the home that she could afford. This all happened under this government's watch, where the, where the caseload blew up from 20,000 in 2022 to 38,000. You can't blame the Liberals for everything. They broke it, but you made it worse. There's still no relief in sight. When will the government actually own up to their failures and actually table a detailed report with timelines to clear the historic high backlog of the LTB? Remind members, members may take their seats. Remind members to make their comments through the chair. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and, and in fact, in fact, the backlog did grow because, Mr. Speaker, there was a pandemic. And when we chose to protect tenants and put a freeze on evictions, of course the backlog grew by a little bit. But, Mr. Speaker, we've invested. If it was left to the NDP, who knows what the number would have been? Because we pivoted very quickly to online hearings. We made sure the people had their had their day in court, and we moved very fast. We made investments in staff. We made investments in technology. We made investments. We doubled the number of adjudicators, Mr. Speaker. We have done so many things. And let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, what what the the NDP have done, Mr. Speaker. They said no. They said have hearings. Don't have hearings. Have them in person. Have them quick. Have them. Mr. Speaker. I think I'm going to start calling it the party of turnstile. Okay. The next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Transportation. Like many communities across Ontario, the city of Brampton is rapidly growing. Every day, new families are calling Brampton home, and along with this rapid growth comes the need to build new transportation networks. 
For 15 years, the previous Liberal government stuck with the status quo and ignored Brampton's growing transportation needs. Rather than making urgently needed investments into large-scale transportation infrastructure, the Liberals were more focused on building bike lanes. It's true. You did that. Now, the people of Brampton, the region of Peel, and the surrounding communities are counting on our government to make the critical transportation investments and upgrades to keep Ontario moving. Speaker, could the minister please explain how our government is expanding public transportation networks in my community and beyond? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Well, Speaker, unlike the previous government, we're focused on getting results for the entire province, including for the city of Brampton. Our government is making incredible progress to improve transportation infrastructure that was neglected in Brampton for far too long under the Liberals and the NDP. This includes upgrades to GO Transit stations in Brampton, one of the busiest stations along the Kitchener GO line. Speaker, the upgrades at Bramley GO station will support two-way all-day GO service along the Kitchener GO line and will make travel easier for the growing Brampton community. The enhanced Bramley GO will include a new bus loop, more parking, and an improved platform that is connected by tunnels and elevators. Speaker, this government is focused on making life easier for the people of Brampton, and I look forward to providing an update on the Bramley station in the near future. Supplementary, back to the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that uh, answer. You know, uh, speaking from experience, I take the Kitchener line most days. I took it this morning. Those trains are packed. What a great investment by this government in the Kitchener line. Uh, and it's great to learn about the upgrades at the Bramley GO station. These improvements will make travel more convenient for individuals and families who rely on this very busy GO line. The previous Liberal government failed to plan ahead for the growth in transportation needs of Brampton. Even now, Liberals and NDP are out of touch with reality, and they take every opportunity to oppose the transportation uh, solutions that Brampton needs, including the Highway 413. Guess they didn't learn their lesson from the last election. As a result, Many residents and commuters are delayed every day Question. with the endless traffic congestion and gridlock, which causes frustration, but it's also a threat to our province's economic prosperity. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is addressing the urgent transportation needs in Brampton and across Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I share the members' frustration. The NDP and the Liberals think they know what's best for Brampton residents, but if it were up to them, nothing would get built. Order. And that is unacceptable, Speaker. Speaker, Speaker we seats. have a balanced approach that expands public transit like Bramley Go and that builds new highways like Highway 413. Speaker, in the last election, the, pe the people of Peel and Brampton spoke, and our government is listening. Speaker, I hear your first hands from residents in Peel Region that the impact the gridlock is having on their lives, on their economy, is unacceptable. We won't stick with the status quo, Mr. Speaker. We are building Highway 413. Speaker, now is the time to act, and now is the time Response. to build. Order. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Minister of Health. Last week, the Canadian press received Freedom of Access of Information's document from the Minister of Health that said, and I quote, Ontario's lack of a long COVID strategy has led to fragmented clinics that offer little to no support to patients. Ontario does not have a coordinated approach to care for patients with post-COVID condition, the Health Ministry's strategic policy branch wrote. So, my question to the Minister, aside from billing codes, can the Minister of Health tell the 750,000 Ontarians living with long COVID where they can access the care they so desperately need? Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Well, with the greatest of respect, Speaker, the, minister, the uh, member opposite is dismissing the fact that we've actually worked with the Ontario Medical Association to make sure that there is appropriate billing codes for our primary care practitioners who are treating and assisting individuals with long COVID. It is an important piece to make sure that individuals with long COVID are not left abandoned by our health care system, which is not going to happen under this government. So to suggest that this is a dismissive, not important piece to ensure that individuals who are suffering with long COVID have the support that they need in the province of Ontario, 
I think shows a great deal of disrespect to those individuals. Yeah. The supplementary question. Since there was no money, several hospitals have established long COVID clinics, but they have mostly relied on redeployed resources from other areas of the hospital. Again, I quote from briefing that the minister received, while some providers are responding to the immediate demand for post-COVID care, these offerings are insufficient, fragmented, and unsustainable without dedicated funding. This model is not sustainable and could result in level to no support for Ontarian with post-COVID need. The briefing warned the minister. These clinics are currently at risk of closure due to the lack of funding. The minister briefing's document said, and everybody agrees, a provincially coordinated approach would be most effective. Minister, where is the dedicated funding for a provincially coordinated approach to care for the 750,000 Ontarians Question. with long COVID like BC, Alberta and Quebec already fund? Minister Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, our Premier and our government has always been there for the people of Ontario when and when, as we experience, whether it is pandemic, ensuring that our public health units, our primary care docs, our hospitals had sufficient resources, and we will continue to do that. There is excellent work happening in both our research hospital facilities as well as at our universities to study and assess the impacts of long COVID. And as we develop and see how those outcomes continue, we will be there as we have been through the entire pandemic to make sure that they have the resources to continue to serve these important long COVID patients. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Peterborough Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a question for the Minister of Energy. Oh. I know that individuals and families in my community, along with people across Ontario, are looking for relief on their home energy costs. While natural gas rates are gradually coming down, the cost remains high, and people are still feeling the financial impact of the global economic instability is causing to everyone. When our government was first elected in 2018, we made a commitment to make life more affordable for Ontario's families. We must make every effort to deliver on our commitment by providing more ways for Ontarians to take control of their energy bills That's right. and encourage energy conservation. You said it. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to make home heating more affordable and cleaner? Minister of Energy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the member from Peterborough, and congratulations to his Pete's on advancing to the OHL final against the London Knights. You know, since day one, our government has been working hard to make sure that life is more affordable for the people of Ontario, particularly on the energy file, Mr. Speaker. And that's why last fall I was pleased to announce four and a half million dollars for the Clean Home Heating Initiative, where members of his community in Peterborough and members in London, home of the Knights, and Members in St. Catharines, home of the Ice Dogs, and members in Sault Ste. Marie, home of the Greyhounds, can apply to get a hybrid home heating system. Just last week, I was pleased to uh, join the Attorney General, and I was pleased to join the member from Barrie Innisville, in Barrie, uh, home of the Colts, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, to announce that our government is bringing that investment up to a total of $8.2 million so that we can offer this additional program to another 500 homes oh. across the city. That's this is fantastic. great news for energy Spons. bills, Mr. Speaker, but it's also great news for the environment. Wow. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I can confirm that all of Peterborough is energized for the Pete's right now. <laughs> it's encouraging to hear that our government has introduced yet another way for consumers to keep costs down, save money, and take control of their energy bills. Here, here. Well, this is positive news. Many individuals and families across our province are struggling with energy costs because of ongoing global economic instability. Our government must show respect for the people of Ontario by continuing to implement programs that offer choices and will help reduce the costs. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the people of Ontario can benefit from the Clean Home Heating Initiative? Minister of Energy. Thanks, Speaker. Thanks again to the member, and good luck to his peats. Our government's excited uh, to provide this opportunity to more communities and more home homeowners across the province to lower not just their home energy bills, but also do their part for the environment and reduce emissions. Uh, the Clean Home Heating Initiative is going to allow ho households to leverage Ontario's world-class 
green energy, clean energy grid that we have to both heat and cool their homes with a hybrid heat pump that switches between electricity and natural gas. Switching to hybrid home heating could save you about $300 a year, Mr. Speaker, on your energy bills. That's a significant amount. And uh, they would also be cutting their emissions by a third, which is great news uh, for the environment. So we know that people across the province want to have more choice, Mr. Speaker. We've been providing that. People Response. across the province want to have more control over their monthly costs, especially on their energy bills. And, Speaker, I'm proud to say that the Ontario government is delivering on that. Yeah. To the next question, the member for Windsor West. My question is to the Premier. The Conservative government's Bill 124 was ruled unconstitutional by the court. Healthcare workers, the union representing hundreds of thousands of workers, and the general public know that Bill 124 is not only unconstitutional, it is disrespectful and specifically targets women-led professions like nursing. Nurses in Windsor-Essex are leaving my community and going to work in Detroit, Michigan, when they are better paid and more respected. Bill 124 continues to push more Canadian nurses to leave Ontario for work. Speaker, it's National Nursing Week, and nurses want to know why the Premier is targeting them and other women-led professions by suppressing their wages and appealing the Bill 124 court ruling. To reply, Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. And I would like to wish all nurses happy Nursing Week. I was actually at Centennial College yesterday. And met with a class. It was their first day of nursing. Order. So congratulations to all those new Order. students who are entering the profession. And we're seeing a record number of students entering into the nursing field because of some of the incentives that we're offering, like the new Learn and Stay program, which the Minister of Health was acknowledging earlier on. This is 2,500 students will have the opportunity for free tuition to enter into the nursing profession, paramedic, lab tech, all their education covered for with a commitment to stay in their communities for two years. But another interesting incentive we're offering is the Community Commitment Program for Nurses, which was launched in June of 2022 at selected Order. hospitals in Ontario to address nursing shortages. And in fact, in about 10 months, at Windsor Regional Hospital has signed up Response. over 200 nurses in this program. This program offers qualified nursing staff $25,000 to sign up and serve at least two years in a designated community. Thank you. A supplementary question. Speaker, there's hundreds of nursing positions in Windsor that go unfilled every single month because of Bill 124. Right. We have a shortage of nurses, and taking them to court to continue to suppress their wages is not the way to make them feel appreciated or respected. The Premier posted a video for National Nursing Week, and he said, I quote, Nurses are the foundation of our health care system, and I encourage everyone to take time this Nursing Week to thank our wonderful nurses for everything they do. End quote. Speaker, to celebrate National Nursing Week, will the Premier stop fighting nurses in court, and will he prove his proclaimed glad gratitude for them by repealing 124 today? Or is he just full of it? I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. I withdraw. To reply, Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think the member Shame failed to, to hear me. 200 exactly. nurses signed up at Windsor Regional Hospital. And I have a quote from the CEO. Yeah. Quote from the CEO at Windsor Regional Hospital. It has been hugely Order. successful. These government programs Order. have really benefited us with recruiting, said Karen Rizal. Windsor Physician Regional Hospital's Order. Chief Operating Officer and Chief Nursing Executive. We have Look another Hamilton 111 graduates Order. starting this summer. Wow. That's a significant number. As the province Great. expands, these strategies these are really important to maintaining our workforce. This is from Karen Riddell, Windsor Regional Hospital, in your riding. The House will come to order. And once again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Orleans. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, climate change is beginning to have a real and measurable impact on how we live our lives. In 2017, the City of Ottawa and communities along the Ottawa River were hit with flooding events that had not been seen in 50 years. Hundreds of residents were impacted, including in East Ottawa. Many lost their homes. In 2019, record levels of water were termed, returned, and this time only worse. Thousands of residents across the region were affected. The city declared a state of emergency, and the army had to be called in to protect critical infrastructure like water treatment facilities and neighborhoods. After a few years of reprieve, general, uh, generational flooding has returned to Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. If not for the most recent events, this year would also be the worst flooding in 50 years. Three generational floods in seven years. Homeowners are tired, volunteers are burnt out, and this can't keep on happening. So, Mr. Speaker, what actions is this, is this government going to take to understand exactly what is happening? And more importantly, what are they going to do to stop it and protect residents from its impacts? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. And through to the uh, member, uh, the City of Ottawa staff uh, contacted our uh, Municipal Service Office yesterday. Uh, regarding the uh, spring flooding and requested that a provincial disaster assistance team be deployed to assess the impact. Um, city staff noted that uh, to our ministry that the, uh, the damage is localized, uh, but it's uh, significant uh, in some of the neighbourhoods uh, around the Ottawa River. Uh, according to municipal staff, um, uh, they've requested that uh, the PDAT team come up. A meeting is scheduled with the city tomorrow. And uh, as uh, all members know, uh, in the spring, um, there are going to be situations like we're experiencing uh, in Whitewater, um, in, uh, in the member for Renfrew, Nippus, and Pembroke's riding. Uh, my ministry office uh, is available Response. in all regions of the province to reach out uh, when a provincial disaster team is required. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2017, after the flooding, affected homeowners were able to apply for disaster recovery assistance for Ontarians to cover the costs of cleanup, repair essential property, and their basic expenses. After the flooding in 2019, residents were also afforded that opportunity, and I know it was greatly appreciated. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, after the devastating Dureco in 2022 that blew down church steeples, ripped off barn roofs, and damaged homes, this government did not offer Ottawa residents that same level of assistance. Many farmers are still reeling from that abandonment, Mr. Speaker. Now that the floodwaters are slowly but surely starting to recede, and apparently the disaster team from the province is in Ottawa, will this government ensure that affected homeowners in the national capital can apply for disaster assistance relief this time? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. According to uh, the member's uh, own municipal staff, the majority of the permanent homes located in the floodplains uh, appear to have insurance that would cover any losses they receive. I want to remind all members uh, that the Disaster Recovery Assistance for Ontarians program is not to replace uh, insurance. Uh, it's a program that provides the minimum basic requirements as, as part of it. The member knows that. Um, as I said, a meeting is scheduled with the ministry uh, and, and uh, the municipality tomorrow. And, and media reports to date suggest that uh, it's approximately 130 properties that may be impacted largely uh, in the West Carleton uh, March Ward. That includes the Constance Bay area. So this is something we're going to continue to monitor. Response. Uh, speaker, I want to assure the member that uh, ministry officials uh, have boots on the ground. Thank you. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Ontario is currently facing a historic shortage of skilled workers across nearly every trade. Simply put, Ontario needs more workers. The numbers are staggering, Mr. Speaker. It's projected that 72,000 workers will be needed by 2027 in the construction sector alone. However, with so many unfilled jobs, it's concerning that the average age of an apprentice is 29 years old. Young people need to be provided with the opportunities to launch into these well-paying well and lifelong careers. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting young people in gaining the skills they need to address our province's overwhelming demand for skilled tradespeople? Thank you. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Carleton uh, for being such a champion of those in the skilled trades. I remember, I remember being with the uh, member uh, with the local iron workers at the Iron Workers uh, Training Centre uh, in her riding, meeting two young female apprentices who really advocated uh, for the government to improve washrooms and improve uh, PPE for uh, women. So I want to thank the member again. Uh, speaker, as the Premier and I uh, often say, a career in the skilled trades is truly a career for life. That is why our government is investing more than $1.5 billion over the next several years uh, to get more young people uh, into the trades. Today, Speaker, I'm pleased to be joined by Sir Janka Paul, Malik De Cruz, Alden Patterson, and Abraham Belisario, who are starting their careers in the skilled trades thanks to the innovative and game-changing Future Builder Scholarship Spons. powered by Scotty Barnes in partnership with the Skilled Trades College of Canada. Working with community leaders and role models like Scotty Barnes, we're going to continue to get more people into the skilled trades. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. Mr. Speaker, when speaking about getting more people into the skilled trades and that the labour shortage is hurting Ontario's economic potential, we need to remove barriers for those who don't currently have jobs but who want to work. Most people who are unemployed or receiving social assistance want to work. Currently, there are nearly 700,000 people in Ontario who are on social assistance, many of whom are seeking employment. However, for some, in, some of these individuals, they may need assistance with retraining and other supports so that their skills better match the jobs of today. Our government must focus on implementing programs that provide practical help for individuals to secure a fulfilling career to support themselves and their families. So through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting Ontarians in securing gainful work? Good Thank question. you. Mr. Labour. Oh, I want to thank the, uh, the member again for that question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is why we're changing our Employment Ontario system uh, for those on social assistance to ensure uh, that we're now buying work boots, we're buying uniforms, we're buying transit passes, we're sitting with those on social assistance to ensure that uh, they're writing resumes properly, that they know how to enter um, uh, interviews uh, to ensure that they can get uh, meaningful employment. Uh, speaker, we've made a lot of changes to employment Ontario throughout the province. In the three regions where we brought forward these changes, I'm proud to announce to the House today that 63,000 people have now gained meaningful employment across the province, filling labour shortages, but most importantly, Mr. Speaker, ensuring that people are providing more income so they can build families Response. around these careers. We're going to continue every single day working for those on social assistance by lifting them up, removing barriers to get into in-demand careers. Next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, last week we heard of a massive tragedy where an eight-year-old girl died after a hit-and-run outside a school in Burlington, Ontario. The girl was trying to cross the driveway to get to the school's entrance when she was hit by a car leaving the parking lot. Speaker, the issue of pedestrian fatalities and severe injuries has become a growing concern for residents and communities, mm -hmm. with 22 deaths and 77 severe injuries reported in Toronto in 2022 alone. The lack of meaningful action in Ontario to ensure safe streets for all is concerning. We here in this House need to do much more. So my question to the Premier is, what action will this government take to prevent these fatal pedestrian accidents? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for her important question. Mr. Speaker, since we were elected in 2018, road safety has been a top priority for our government, and I just want to underline the fact that road safety is not a partisan issue. Our government has worked closely with members of the opposition caucus on these important measures because we want to do everything we can to protect our vulnerable road users. Since September of 2018, Mr. Speaker, we implemented important changes that will protect vulnerable road users. We've increased penalties for drivers who fail to yield for pedestrians at crosswalks, at crossovers at school crossing, at crossovers and at school crossings. We've increased the maximum fine penalty for all general offenses, Mr. Speaker, under the Highway Traffic Act. And we've introduced a new offense for careless driving causing death or bodily harm with penalties that include fines, license suspensions, and imprisonment. Mr. Speaker, Spons. this offense carries the longest prison term of any penalty in the Highway Traffic Act. But Mr. Speaker, 
This is not a one and done issue, Mr. Speaker. It's an ongoing priority, and we're going to continue to work with Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, I agree with the minister on one thing. Road safety is not a partisan issue. And we have also introduced a solution, Bill 40, the Moving Ontarians Safely Act, which will enshrine measures to prevent more lives from being impacted by unsafe roads. And I think of my friend right here, the member from St. Catharines, whose mother was hit by a driver on March 24th as she crossed the street in front of another elementary school. She was knocked nine feet in the air and hurled for 20 feet. She's still in hospital. So I ask this government, Will this government commit to making our roads safer by passing this bill? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, any form of aggressive uh, and distracted driving is unacceptable, and it will not be tolerated by this government. Mr. Speaker, our government introduced community safety zones around schools for this specific issue to make sure that drivers take extra care when they are driving around our most vulnerable, our children, Mr. Speaker. We have allowed municipalities to introduce this around schools, and we're doing everything we can to support community safety zone implementation across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we understand that in la last year alone, sorry, in 2021 alone, over 250,000 tickets were issued to vehicles that are captured by spe speed cameras who are, who are noticing speeding in these community safety zones. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to support our municipalities as they take the measures that they can to support vulnerable road to protect vulnerable road users, especially around schools, Mr. Speaker. And we're going to continue to do what we can to keep our roads, make sure that our roads are among the safest anywhere in North Fine. America. Thank you. The next question. The member for Hastings Lennox and Annie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. Speaker, for so long under the previous Liberal government, so many opportunities to foster economic growth across Northern Ontario were lost or ignored. The strengths, the assets, and the abilities found in so many of our rural, remote, and Indigenous communities were ignored. And as a result, their full potential has never been realized. Our government must respect the people of Northern Ontario, and we must implement solutions that will allow all Ontarians to have more opportunities to create and expand their economic potential. Our government must continue to invest in programs and projects that will help Northern Ontario keep it, be, keep it competitive and current. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting prosperity and opportunities in Northern Ontario? Minister of Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to try, but first I want to thank the member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington for his amazing job and the important contributions he makes to our caucus. You know, it's that time of year, uh, Mr. Speaker. Spring is finally here uh, across Northern Ontario. And uh, leaders from across uh, across our vast region uh, meet for um, uh, for an opportunity to discuss best practices. And every year, Mr. Speaker, especially for the past five, under the leadership of this premier and the commitment from the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, to join municipal leaders and talk about the opportunities across Northern Ontario, that was in full display in Thunder Bay, Mr. Speaker. What a lineup! Minister Surma, Clark, Dunlop, Lecce, Peary, Minister Smith, and of course, fondly the what I like to call the Minister for Thunder Bay, our amazing parliamentary assistant Kevin Holland, Mr. Speaker. We made a direct point to the importance of business expansion and development and 179 job replacement, uh, placements for the, to the tune of $7.8 million. We're on fire up. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think I just heard $7.5 million. It's encouraging that our government is supporting common sense measures that will continue to build prosperity across Northern Ontario. Many communities across the North are eager to take advantage of these opportunities that will help create jobs and expand business operations. Our government must continue to work with our Northern partners to build a stronger Ontario. Speaker, the people across the North are counting on our government to deliver on our commitment to invest in key priorities that are relevant and important to their communities. Speaker, can the minister please expand on how our government is continuing to invest in projects that will strengthen communities in Northern Ontario? 
Minister of Northern Development. Enough about Northwestern Ontario. Let me shift to nor uh, Northeastern Ontario, where yesterday I and my colleagues helped to kick off uh, FANOM, the Federation of Northern Ontario uh, Municipalities Conference, Mr. Speaker. A phenomenal agenda, Mr. Oh, Speaker. And no, there we were again, several cabinet ministers making important uh, uh, announcements about what's going on in northeastern Ontario. I made a bit of a pivot, Mr. Speaker. There's so many beautiful little small towns up there in northeastern Ontario, and they appreciate our community development tranche that we put into the um, NOHFC when we modernized it. To the tune of $5 million, Mr. Speaker, we talked about Blind River and, and, and rehabilitating their curling club. The Township of St. Joseph's rehabilitating a children's library, Mr. Speaker, and in Gore Bay, upgrading the harbour front and making it more accessible. These are the things that matter, Mr. Speaker, to young families and retirees in our communities, good, hard-working families who want a great quality of life, and we remain committed to just that. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Paul, a tenant in my riding, was saved from homelessness thanks to the Canada-Ontario Housing Benefit. This subsidy was supposed to last until spring 2024, but after the government has slashed funds to this program, the funds are now set to run out by the end of the month in Toronto. Will this government properly fund this program to keep individuals and families from ending up on the streets? To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And again, Speaker, I, I just I can't believe some of the lines of questioning we get from the New Democratic Party. Uh, given the fact that we've increased our wow. homelessness prevention program by $202 million and in, and in the City of Toronto by an additional $48 million. Wow. You know, we, we continue to work with our service managers and we continue to work with the federal government. It's interesting that this member asked the question about a cost-shared program under the Canada-Ontario Housing Benefit as part of the National Housing Strategy, where this member and his party refuse to stand up for tenants and citizens in asking for our fair share of federal dollars. We're being shortchanged $480 million by the federal government, Response. and the NDP continue to sit on their hands. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Aside from the very fascinating spin we just heard now, the government has responded to this in the media and simply blamed the cost of skyrocketing rents. But the government must take responsibility for the cost of out-of-control rent right now because there is an immediate solution, and it's called rent control. Tenants don't have time to wait for a market adjustment. They need relief right now. Will this government support the NDP's call to bring back rent control right now? You know, Speaker, two, day, two days in a row, and the NDP continue to talk about failed policies, yeah. right? You know, again, Order. we put a plan in place that has seen, in the last two years, record. a record Order. amount of purpose-built rental construction in our province, something that every community, no matter what corner of the province you're in, we need more purpose-built rental. What have we seen? Last year, 2021, 15,000 new purpose-built rental starts. The year before, over 13,000. The highest we've seen since the early or since the mid-80s. Again, we continue to work with our municipal partners. We continue to put a plan in place. But again, Speaker, I want to remind this member. You know, the NDP have selective Order. amnesia Response. when they come to the House. Here, here's, here's a party that continues to vote against all of the housing support that we give. They want high fees, high taxes Order. on our nonprofits and our affordable housing. Thank you. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Oh, Ontario's labour shortage is at a crisis point, particularly in the skilled trades. The impact that the shortage of workers is having on our province is reflected in the number of job vacancies, as well as in the supply chain challenges and higher prices for services. We know that building a stronger Ontario where people and businesses can thrive starts with our youth. 
By strengthening and investing in our skilled trades and apprenticeship system, we can ensure that Ontario's younger generation will be best prepared for the jobs of today and tomorrow. Right. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to increase the number of skilled trade workers? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that great question. Growing up in a family of plumbers, I witnessed firsthand the importance of tradespeople and the value that they contribute to local communities. Our government is committed to addressing labour shortages head-on, and that starts with post-secondary education. That is why we continue to advocate and promote our Ontario College's skilled trades and apprenticeship programs across the province to further enhance opportunities for college students to enter the workforce with job-ready skills, our government expanded the degrees that colleges can offer to now include new three-year degrees and more four-year degrees in applied areas of study. Our government also invested $60 million of funding to support Ontario's first micro-credential strategy and expanded OSAP to ensure that they are eligible to help workers retain and upgrade their skills. As Ontario faces a growing labour shortage in the skilled trades, we are making the necessary adjustments for students to enter skilled trade programs. Because, Mr. Speaker, when you have a job in the trade, you have a reliable career for life. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. Sixty million for micro credentialing is amazing. Now, while it's great to hear how our government is prioritizing the skilled trades, it's important to recognize that opportunities have not been equal for all Ontarians who are interested in this sector. The stigma that has developed around being a tradesperson remains a barrier that many individuals, particularly young women, have encountered in trying to pursue a career in this field. In 2021, women represented less than 4% of workers in automotive and construction skilled trades. Our government must address the ongoing labour shortage across our province by recognizing and supporting the Question. vital role that women have in building a stronger Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is creating better conditions for women to enter and succeed in the trade? Mr. Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker. And the member is absolutely right. For years, we have seen a real stigma around having a career in the trades, especially directed towards women. Speaker, this has to end. Not only are trades a great way to get into an in-demand and high-paying career, but trades are essential to ensuring Ontario's future economic prosperity. Having grown up in a skilled trades family, I know firsthand the best way to get someone interested in the trades is to expose them to it at a young age. That is why I was proud to attend the Jill of All Trades event at Centennial College last year and see all of the young women who attend similar events across the province. This is a one-day event at various college campuses where high school girls are able to experience rewarding career options in the trades and teaches them that the trades are an option for them. Speaker, it is projected that one Once. in five new job openings in Ontario are likely to be in the skilled trades occupations by 2025. I'm proud that our government will continue to give women and all learners flexible. Thank you very much. The next question, member from the Speakerwalk, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. The STEM scholar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have a lack of teaching staff, uh, and the quality of education has actually uh, uh, is important because we need actually qualified teacher. So, how can we make sure that we can face the need for uh, more teachers? The uh, councils that are actually put in place are very important, and after the pandemic, the situation has gotten worse. So we know in north of Ontario, the situation, for example, with the Laurentian University has become worse and worse. So the question is for the Premier, when are you going to organize and put in place the recommendations that were given to this government? Thank you very much. Le ministre de Just first off, note: we brought forth legislation to this House, the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act. In that bill, 
responding to the concerns cited by the members opposite. We have required the Ontario College of Teachers to certify educators from the Francophonie, for example, by at least 50 per cent uh, faster. We are requiring better processing times at the college, one of the principal concerns of French language education stakeholders. Mr. Speaker, in addition to that, we are requiring new educators to be better trained on literacy, on math, on special education, on leadership, and on literacy promotion. Now, Mr. Speaker, if the members opposite want to work with government on this, they will vote for that bill. We just brought forth a budget, a commitment to hire 2,000 more teachers to benefit our public our Catholic, our English and French school systems. But those measures, Bonds. those investments, that additional staff has been opposed systematically by the NDP. I really do hope, in good faith, you will vote for this bill so we can work together to resolve a long-standing national issue of a French teacher shortage in this country. Supplementary question. Mr. President. So, Mr. Speaker, the minister must believe what he says because actually is uh, uh, what he's saying is not true we have catholic school boards which say that the programs and the curricula are not working we have seen in june 2021 the fact that the government has put in place a new a new strategy which was actually not based on the expert advice so we need to solve the problem of lack of teachers in French. Then the uh, a new strategy has been put in place, but two years later, we are still waiting for a new solution. So, Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the same question. When this government is going to put in place the recommendations uh, given by experts in order to put an end to the lack of teachers in the French language and to be able to have a continuity in the French education system. We brought together unions, school boards, and the French language community in, in conjunction with the Minister of Francophone Affairs for the first time to resolve an issue that has preceded our government. It's a long standing national issue of access to French language educators. And we responded with a $13 million investment and a commitment to attract the best and brightest teachers from the broader Francophone community, and we're seeing the results in Ontario schools today. We literally have new teachers attracted as a consequence of that action and that investment. But I understand fully, we understand the need to continue to work together to resolve this issue. We brought forth legislation designed to certify those individuals, those teachers faster. We, had, we brought forth a plan to better train them and support them. And Mr. Speaker, in addition, we have a plan to help hire over 350 certified French Response. language educators. We've increased the budget for French language education to the highest levels ever in Ontario history. We'll continue to invest and work together to help French students succeed. The next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, today my son is working in a trade. He's 18 years old and he's learning how to be an electrician. That's so exciting for me. But Ontario continues to experience the largest labour shortage in a generation. There is tremendous need for skilled trades workers across Ontario, including in my communities in Brantford and Brant. Unfortunately, for 15 years, the previous Liberal government ignored the importance of equipping students for the jobs of the future. As a result, Ontario has seen a decline in the completion of apprenticeship certification and trades diplomas. That is why our government must do all that we can to encourage students who are interested in pursuing a career in this vital industry. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is empowering students with early exposure to technology in the skilled trades? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, the member from Brantford Brant, for this question, for his passion on this issue. We are working together to make sure that we have a talented um, generation, next generation of young people who are prepared to enter the skilled trades to get good jobs and create good lives and opportunities for themselves. It's why, Speaker, we followed the advice of skilled trades professionals for the first time in the legislation before the House to allow more mid-career certified professionals who work in the skilled trade space to work within our schools to leverage that experience that you just can't duplicate in, a, uh, in an academic space. We need these hands-on workers. We're doing that in the bill. We're allowing new skilled trades graduation coaches for the first time leveraging people in the private sector in the trenches working to build this country and this province to work with kids to give them meaningful pathways to employment and to professional development. Mr. Speaker, we also most recently Response. required every student in Ontario 
to, to take at least one technological education course for the third of girls that take that course, creating pathways for all of them to succeed. We know this is going to make a difference to build the economy. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It's great to see that our government continues to make progress in helping students gain the skills necessary for rewarding careers. In fact, it was about a year ago that the minister came to Brantford and Brant, and we announced a new Catholic high school. And I'm working with the Catholic Board to make sure that that's a trade-focused high school. But we need to do more. In my riding of Brantford Brant, Patriot Forge is a leading employer that needs more skilled trades workers so they can meet their growing demands, expand operations, and provide financial opportunities to their employees. It is outstanding companies like Patriot Forge that are helping Ontario remain competitive and further our economic prosperity. Their success as a local business and our success as a province depend on a highly skilled workforce. This starts with students getting interested in the skilled trades Question. from a young age. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the actions our government is taking to ensure that employers in Ontario can attract and retain the workers that they need to succeed and thrive? Thank you. Of education. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Speaker, in the House today, we have Beaverworks, the FRC Team 2609 with us today. Congratulations. These young people, these amazing young people were part of the winning alliance to win the first robotics world championship in Texas, and I will note they were the only Canadian team to compete. It is that type of excellence in this province we want to harness, and we want to make sure more students succeed. In the new curriculum in math, Students now, as a requirement, learn how to build a robot. Every grade, starting in grade one, is, the, is, is required to learn how to code the robot. We are giving young people competitive advantage. When you, when you compare Ontario to the rest of this country, we're leading and we're investing with a modern curriculum relevant to the job market, giving young people the life and the job skills they need to succeed. We're going to continue to increase investment, Mr. Speaker, over $690 million more dollars, continue to modernize the curriculum, and continue to stand up for these young people and have a success in our economy. Time for question period has expired. A couple of members have informed me they have points of order. I recognize the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services first. Speaker, Speaker, I'd like to invite all members and guests to tonight's reception hosted by the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Society and the Children's Aid Foundation of Canada. And I want to spe specifically thank CEOs Nicole Bonney and CEO Valerie McMurtry. Sp Speaker, the reception starts at 5.30 in room 228. I hope everyone joins us. Thank you. And on the point of order, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, I, I hope everyone will join me in also welcoming uh, more community members from Scarborough here with us today. Fazila Wedemeyer, Kareem Wedemeyer, Nilos Wedemeyer, Jaden Wedemeyer, and Amrik Wedemeyer. Welcome to your house. Thank you. There being no further business this morning, this house stands in recess until 3 p.m.